Over the past century, it had attracted a variety of foreign visitors to her shores, among the first being the French explorer and writer Le Marquis de Barthélemy, who settled there in the mid-1800s. He may have chosen Cameron for its tranquil beauty, but most of those who followed were attracted by its deep natural harbor and strategic military location. Among the first to recognize this were the Russians. In 1905, 50 ships of the Royal Imperial Baltic Fleet took shelter there on their way to the ill-fated battle with the Japanese at the Tushima Straits. In 1939, recognizing the growing Japanese military threat, the French built a small military installation on Binba Island, constructing barracks and placing coastal guns upon its summit. The French defenses here and elsewhere in Indochina proved to be of little use as the Japanese took control of Vietnam in July 1941. While there, the Japanese made additional improvements to the port and its defenses, preparing a place to shelter their southwestern naval fleet. In 1942, Cameron became an assembly point for warships and transports for Japan's invasion of Malaysia, which ultimately led to the capture of Singapore. Cameron remained safe and peaceful until the 25th of January 1944, when American B-29s dropped several hundred mines into the harbor during Operation Matterhorn. A year later, on the 12th of January 1945, the U.S. Navy began Operation Gratitude, sending Task Force 38 on a strike against Japanese in French Indochina. Among the targets were Japanese ships reported to be anchored at Cameron Bay. When the Navy's Grumman F6F5 Hellcats got there, they found the Navy had already abandoned Cameron, but found and destroyed 20 seaplanes remaining in the harbor. Cameron would not see much activity again until 1954 when the defeated French used the port as a principal evacuation point for their troops, the last of them leaving in July 1956 at the end of French colonial rule. The first Americans came to Cameron on the 19th of July 1964. Aboard the USS Epping Forest and Mine Flotilla 1 were the men of Mine Division 33, who had come to carry out hydrographic and beach surveys and to explore sites for facilities ashore. To assist in the survey and provide security, the crew also included an explosive ordnance disposal team, an underwater demolition team, a mobile inshore underwater surveillance team, the HMM-364 helicopter detachment, and the First Force Recon Marines. Crew members found that Cameron of 1964 was yet unspoiled, its sandy beaches sugar white, and its crystal water so clear that old sunken Vietnamese junks could be seen in the depths below. The only structures to be seen ashore were some World War II pillboxes, a string of French colonial buildings astride the bay shore, and a small two-berth pier which had been recently constructed under the U.S. military assistance program. Mine Division 33 completed their work 11 days later, leaving Cameron for their home port of Sasebo, Japan on the 30th of July, just three days before the first Gulf of Tonkin incident. Their preparatory work proved fortitious when, in response to President Johnson's huge troop build-up in 1965, Cameron was chosen as one of four deep-draft seaports to be developed in Vietnam. The other three were Da Nang in the north, Quy Nhan in the north-central, and Saigon in the south, each supporting troops in their regions. With 160,000 American troops due to arrive by the end of 1965, port and base construction began with the greatest urgency. Most waterborne cargo was received at Saigon, the only port with deep draft piers except for the small pier at Cameron Bay. The needs of the U.S. military alone far exceeded the port's capacity, even without the competing needs of USAID and the Vietnamese government to offload millions of tons of foodstuffs and nation-building materials. At one time, before the ports were completed, more than 100 deep draft vessels were in Vietnamese or nearby waters awaiting discharge, some of them for several months. For military planners, it logically followed that major air bases capable of accommodating large jet aircraft should also be developed at each of these ports, mainly because there was a need for high-capacity port facilities to quickly satisfy aircraft demands for petroleum and ammunition. Cameron and the other three bases would all become huge military installations with multiple deep draft piers, 10,000-foot runways, and a whole range of facilities including ammunition and petroleum depots, warehouses, hangars, hospitals, 
administrative buildings, barracks, mess halls, and defensive structures, as well as electrical, water, drainage, and communication systems. In addition, these and scores of other bases to be built required a transportation infrastructure both on and off base, amounting to thousands of miles of roads, hundreds of bridges, and thousands of culverts. The buildup in Vietnam would require far more construction units than existed in all the armed services. In mid-1965, civilian contractors were called in to fill the gap. They were assigned to construct airfield runways and pavements, roads, utilities, POL facilities, ammunition storage facilities, and control towers. At their peak in 1966, civilian contractors numbered 51,000, of which 90% were Vietnamese. In total, the Vietnamese construction program of 1965 was probably the largest concentrated effort of its kind in history. Before construction could begin at these ports, military engineers and civilian contractors needed a secure environment. Among the first security forces to arrive on the scene were the men of the Navy's Coastal Surveillance Force, known as Task Force 115, whose headquarters was established in Saigon on the 11th of March, 1965. The Coastal Surveillance Operation, codenamed Market Time, was organized around nine patrol sectors covering the 1,200 miles South Vietnamese coast from the DMZ to the Cambodian border and extending 40 miles out to sea. Within these areas, ships and craft of the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Coast Guard, and the South Vietnamese Navy sought to prevent enemy infiltration of supplies and munitions by sea. To assist the ships in their mission, Navy aircraft operating from ships offshore and from bases in South Vietnam, Thailand, and the Philippines flew search patterns over the market time area. Market time operations began in the Cameron area in May 1965 with the arrival of Martin P-5 Marlin seaplanes operating from the seaplane tenders Salisbury Sound and Currituck. On the 9th of June 1965, the Army's 35th Engineer Group Headquarters, together with elements of the 864th and 84th Engineer Battalions, debarked on the Cameron Peninsula, becoming the first major units to come ashore. They had to provide for their own security until mid-July when troops of the 2nd Brigade, 1st Infantry Division arrived. A couple of weeks later, they were replaced by a battalion from the 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne Division. These two brigades were the first U.S. Army combat troops deployed in Vietnam. In December 1965, the Republic of Korea's 2nd Marine Regiment, known as the Blue Dragons, arrived to provide additional security. Locally, they were called ROCKS and were known for being ferocious fighters. Until other ports were built, cargo often had to be offloaded from deep draft vessels to smaller landing craft, including tank landing ships and amphibious landing craft, then taken ashore across undeveloped beaches.